I'm going to talk about something which uh, is, in a sense, a continuation from the very first topic that uh, was covered by Beanie uh, during the first dinner. Uh, but he, uh, since he's an oil and gas executive working for a corporation, he talked about uh, oil and gas in Israel and the future of oil and gas from a very practical corporate business perspective. I'll uh, talk about it from a broader perspective uh, in terms of policies, the role uh, of government, and how that affects economic growth. Uh, but I have also a corporate background some time ago. Uh, like Beanie, I also worked for a an oil corporation, uh, not for Noble Energy, but for a BP. I'm sure all of you heard about it. Um, I've been uh, dealing with oil and gas uh, and energy economics for the last uh, roughly, give or take, 15 years. Uh, as I said, I worked for BP. I worked uh, uh, a long time ago, I worked for the Russian government. And uh, currently, uh, I work for my own consulting firm, and I also run a think tank uh, dedicated specifically to oil and gas uh, economics, uh, looking at it from what I would describe a free market, pro-market and pro um, and classical liberal uh, perspective. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, will cover broadly three topics. Um, I'll try to answer three questions. Uh, one is um, the recent, I'll go from the recent events um, that all of you have heard about because I think they're very instrumental in understanding what is going on um, in the oil sector and more generally how is the oil sector organized. Uh, and that is the fall in the oil prices that started in 2014 and in a sense, is continuing, uh, but uh, definitely uh, was going on from 2014 to 2016. And uh, the role of creative destruction, uh, as uh, the economist Schumpeter called it, in the oil industry. The second one is the role of the state in managing natural resources. So uh, how, and that is, that basically answered the first question on the first slide, curse or blessing, whether natural resources and more specifically oil and gas are a curse or a blessing, and how institutions determine the answer to this question. And finally, uh, and that is I think something that has uh, a lot of relevance to Israel, uh, is in light of the lower oil prices and everything that we know today about uh, oil economics. Uh, how is it going to affect countries dependent on oil and gas exports? Now, this is not yet relevant to Israel 100% because Israel is not yet dependent on oil and gas exports. But given what we heard uh, the day before yesterday, uh, it is likely that Israel might depend more on gas exports. Maybe oil to some degree, but mostly gas. So I think it is a very good idea to preemptively understand uh, if Israel is moving towards becoming more of a natural resource economy. We don't know to which degree. It's not going to be like Saudi Arabia, that's for sure. But to some degree, if that's going to be the case, then how is it going to affect Israel's future? And what are the choices that can be made? Those three questions. As I said, I'll start with uh, the oil price. Uh, and uh, in the beginning uh, and in the end and intermittently in between, I'll give some examples. Uh, and I'll start with uh, the, uh, some examples related to Russia because, as you know from yesterday, I was born in the Soviet Union and raised in Russia. So it's close to my heart, but also I think it is quite an, uh, a helpful example uh, 
to, um, to understand the dynamics of uh, uh, what is called a petro state, a, uh, another word for uh, a country dependent on oil and gas exports. So it's a very a colorful and um, important example of a petro state. The oil price in the recent years has followed that dynamic. Essentially, as you can see, it in the in the course of one and a half years, it went from a hundred eleven dollars, almost a hundred twelve dollars a barrel, in June two thousand fourteen, to thirty dollars a barrel in January two thousand sixteen. So uh, one third, it's what I would call a collapse. Okay, today it's around 50, but this is still uh, less than a half of what it used to be just two and a half, oops, two and a half years ago, right? So quite low by recent historical standards. And uh, what is indicative, I think, of um, let me follow the time so that we don't run out of time. Um, what is, I think, uh, indicative of uh, how um, oil, and oil and gas economies um, react to lower prices is the reaction of, of their politicians. And as I said, I'll start with the Russian example, uh, and I'll finish with the Russian example. Um, so I'll give you a few quotes, and you'll see how politicians react to uh, unexpected events. Uh, those are all quotes from Russian politicians and executives. And you can see that back in 2013, when the oil price was above $100 a barrel, very high, the, the highest by historical standards, uh, Russian politicians and oil men uh, specifically one of them representing uh, Leonid Fidun representing the Russian uh, one of the Russian biggest uh, oil companies Luke Oil said that over the next 10 years oil prices will not fall below a hundred dollars per barrel and that was just less than a year before they actually collapsed so that kind of reflects the mentality of a lot of people in the oil industry and in politics uh, before the oil price collapse. It will last for a long while and probably forever, longer than we need to worry about, okay? But when it starts, started falling, the reaction was a bit like an ostrich, you know, like an ostrich who puts its head in the sand when something happens. So it was an ostrich reaction. Uh, you can see that basically almost every month, uh, either one of Putin's colleagues or Putin himself or one of the Russian economy ministers would say, okay, the oil price will not fall below $90 per barrel, but 90 is also a good price, so nothing to worry about. We can work under such conditions. Putin then says, if the oil price falls below $80 per barrel, the world economy will collapse. <laughs> My goodness. Oh, well, we're at 50 today. Uh, the price of oil will be fluctuating between $70 and $70 per barrel in 2015. So every month they would say, okay, 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 it's, it's 70 now, so, but there's no way it can go below 70. Or, oops, 60, all right, all right. But no way it can go be below 60. Um, and then finally, $50 per barrel is a price for years to come. Only next year they found out that it actually w went below 30. So that's the kind of reaction you get. The next stage is uh, when the ostrich pulls its head out of the sand, looks around and thinks, okay, reality is different from what I had thought. So maybe I need to start recognizing it, but I really don't want to. So I need to find an explanation for what is happening. And one of the possible explanations, what could it be? Oh, maybe I can, Put, shift the blame to someone for what happened. And a nice conspiracy theory would just do right. So then we hear the, the same guy you saw on the previous slide, this gentleman here, 
Igor Sechin, one of some people consider him to be the second most influential man in Russia and the head of the biggest uh, Russian oil company, Rosneft. Um, the same man said that, um, and I, I'll quote, uh, in today's distorted oil market, prices do not reflect reality. That's an interesting one to start. Uh, they're driven instead by financial speculation, which outweighs the real-life factors of supply and demand. Financial markets tend to produce economic bubbles, and those bubbles tend to burst. Uh, the interesting fact is that he came up with this curious theory only when oil prices collapsed, those bubbles and speculation never worried him when prices were at $100 per barrel. That was absolutely fine. It's only when they st reached $30 per barrel, he realized that it was all a result of a grand conspiracy of financial speculators. Well, of course, it was not. Um, but what was it? What happened? Um, and let's step take a step back and think, well, it's not just about why the price collapsed, but if it collapsed, it must have been very high, also high by historical standards. So it must have reached a certain high level from which it collapsed. Why did that happen, right? So it's important to understand what actually happened in the oil market and how it was driving. And I'll I'll tell you why this is important. It's not important for the s sake of the oil industry itself. You know how um, you often look at uh, uh, financial market uh, uh, indicators and uh, foreign exchange uh, indicators, and you look at what do you usually see in Yahoo Finance, first of all, or if you look at the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, one of the first thing on the top is the uh, Euro dollar exchange rate, you know, is the S&P 500. What else is it? The third is usually the oil price. The oil price is an essentially important indicator of the development of the global economy. Why that happened is a different question, and um, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We can, if you want, uh, talk about it during the Q&A, um, but there are reasons why that happened, and one of the reasons is uh, what I would call the politicization of the oil market. It's not just that oil is an essential fuel. Obviously it is, and it is the, bu the biggest fuel right now. It will be at some point replaced by gas, which is brilliant for Israel. But uh, right now in the global energy mix, uh, oil is the biggest component. It's not the majority, but it is the biggest share. Uh, so it is essential but also because uh, many countries depend on it in terms of exports. And their political regimes, think of Russia, think of a lot of countries in this region, their political regimes depend on oil. So it's intertwined with politics, right? Um, so that's, that's why it's important to understand how has oil price dynamics affected politics as well. And if you look at the historical dynamic, then you'll see that something interesting happens. So uh, here, here's the history, and we, now we're really taking a big step back, all the way back into the 19th century, because that's when the commercial production of oil started. Do you know where it started? As a com commercial fuel. Yep. Exactly, and more precisely, Texas? no, not Texas. Hmm? Sorry, California? nope. A lot of good things started in California, but not this one. <laughs> Sorry, Pennsylvania. yes, thank you. We get some support from the back, yes, Pennsylvania, exactly. So, uh, 1861. Uh, commercial production of oil started in Pennsylvania. And by the way, the interesting thing is, as with many things in life, uh, oil before its discovery as a fuel was considered to be a mineral nuisance. Like they would 
dig for other things and then they would hit oil and think, oh, you know, I don't need this black substance. How do we use it? So it was not practically useful before that time. So obviously when it became useful and when it was discovered as a fuel uh, that it can uh, generate energy, then of course uh, its price went up as you would expect. And by the way, the red line you see here is more important than the blue line for us. Um, because as Robert Barrow used the same economic terminology yesterday, you have a real and nominal prices. So the red line is the real price uh, adjusted to inflation and, to, uh, it, and it, expressed, it, is, it is expressed in 2015 dollars. So the red line is the real price of oil expressed in today's prices. And what you see is that, as you would expect with a uh, new good on the market, it price, its price went up significantly in the beginning. But then, as you would expect with most other goods, um, it went down and then it kind of stabilized. With of course, this period is a very long period, uh, historically speaking. But um, if you look at the big picture here, it is relatively stable. I mean, wars, depression, and so on, but relatively stable. And that's the behavior of a normal good. Nothing abnormal about it. What is abnormal is what we see here. A price overhung. This is very strange. And it started, you can see here, you, you won't see the precise year, but I'll tell you, in 1973, that uh, overhung of prices. And it kind of has like a camel, um, two of those here, with a drop in the middle. Um, there are, so the question is why did that happen? And there are several theories, some of them developed by oil economists, some of them developed by political theorists, uh, and um, just lay commentators. Um, one of them, uh, one of those theories uh, is that uh, oil and other natural resources are different from other goods. So they have a different uh, dynamic of prices and uh, oil, uh, the oil price, uh, the oil price increase is due to that fact. But that's actually uh, not, ev oops, well that's a bit of a problem. Um, this is actually not the case, if you look at oil in comparison to uh, other mineral commodities. So, for instance, in this picture you can see that, uh, it, again, oil up until the same year that I just mentioned, 1973, uh, behaved like the rest of uh, mineral commodities and even agricultural commodities are shown here. So, they followed the same path. Nothing. Spe uh, sp uh, nothing special about oil, right? Uh, but then something happened. Um, and you can, if I can make it work. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so uh, you can see that this is a comparison of where oil is singled out and the rest of commodities, non-oil commodities, uh, are compared. If, they, if, you, if you take uh, non oil commodities as 100% and compare oil dynamics, price dynamics, you can see again that in 73, oil, before 73, oil was actually even a little bit cheaper than a basket of other commodities. But in 73, it sharply went up and continued to be much more expensive than the rest of commodities, right? Something must have happened, because this is not normal behavior. Um, there was another theory. So the theory that it is 
all, commodi all, min all mineral commodities are not normal is not right. They, they are normal. Oil is different or was different. We'll see. Uh, there was another theory. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. It uh, is called the uh, peak oil theory. And what it says is that uh, oil is different because there's such high demand for it and there's li limited supply of it, or rather there are limited reserves of it in the ground. So the price appreciates because the market knows that there is a limited supply of it and uh, demand for it is growing faster than supply and especially reserves of oil in the ground. Well, it sounds kind of logical, um, apart from the fact that it's not true, right? Um, the reason it's not true is that, and now think about it, it's very interesting. Um, when oil production started in the 19th century and then expanded into countries like Azerbaijan, um, you know, uh, the Middle East, uh, and gradually to many other countries, to Mexico, uh, beyond the United States. Oil reserves, and that means reserves in the ground, started to grow um, because ex oil and gas exploration uh, was growing as well. But the interesting thing is that today we have several times, actually, uh, several dozens of times more reserves in the ground of oil than we had a hundred years ago. As a matter of fact, even in more recent years, if you look at the last 30, 40 years, you can see that reserves continue to grow. And that's interesting because demand for oil, so the consumption of oil, is growing, but the reserves are not falling. So you, if you had a limited amount of it in the ground, you would expect them to continue to fall because oil is being extracted over and over and over, and then finally it's exhausted. But that's not the case. And the reason for this is the following, that um, unlike what we think, that when you see a number, right, if you see uh, a thousand, thousand millions of barrels of oil in the ground, let's say, uh, you know, you can have uh, 700 um, billion barrels in the ground of proven reserves. Uh, when you see that number, and uh, sometimes you see in the media, it says, well, we have another 50 years of oil consumption at current rates. And that's it. After 50 years, it's gone. There's no more oil. Well, this is not the case. When you look at this number, this doesn't mean that this is all the oil in the ground. What it actually means is that this is the oil that we know is in the ground, but actually this is a more narrow category. This is not just all the oil that we know is in the ground. This is the oil that is technically recoverable, as we say in the oil industry, which means we, just, we don't just know it's in the ground. We can, with current modern technology extracted from the ground. And the third criteria for the number you see is not just that it can be technically extractable, but that you can make a profit out of this oil. So it's a very narrow category. The, uh, there is a broader category which is called resources, recoverable resources and uh, known resources. And that's, it's several times that number. Right? So once technology is there to extract it, and once the economic conditions are right, there could be uh, much bigger reserves in the ground, and there will be. And this is the reason why reserves are constantly growing. Uh, you know, they're, they're growing as we consume more oil. It may seem illogical, but this is the case, because human ingenuity outperforms our uh, consumption and demand for oil. So this uh, oil price increase uh, was not due to the oil peak theory. And by the way, some economists believed, and those are usually not economists who know much about the oil theory, they just build models, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, 
some economists believed in the peak oil theory up until a certain time. Now it's generally regarded as wrong. It's one of those theories which people thought could be uh, right, but then they uh, got disillusioned. Um, so why? The question is why? Why did uh, oil? Um, why did the oil price grow so fast? Why did it get to the level where it was? Uh, and again, in 2014, when it collapsed, something else happened. And you know how? Uh, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about the uh, notion of the black swan, uh, the black swan event. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, the American uh, uh, economist, uh, trader, who became a philosopher in some sense, uh, and a writer who wrote uh, several books, including uh, The Black Swan and Fooled by Random Randomness. Um, he came up with this idea that there are disruptive events which m uh, change the, cor uh, the course of history. And um, in many ways, those are the unknown unknowns. Uh, there are scenarios that we can kind of predict. We don't know the probabilities, but we can see where, where history or economics is taking us. But the unknown unknowns are things that we don't foresee, that we don't expect. And then they happen unexpectedly and make a big change. So uh, the oil price collapse was a black swan event. Very few people saw it coming. Definitely no one knew when it would happen and the magnitude of it. Uh, but as it happens with complicated events, and there's, there are not many um, uh, things which are more complicated than the oil market. Um, as it happens, changes in the oil market are the result of a multitude of other changes. So one of the black swan events was this, the emergence of ISIS. Uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. And what's remarkable ab about it is that it happened um, unexpectedly, but it's also interesting that it coincided almost exactly with the collapse of the oil price. And that gives you a hint to what happened with the oil price as well. Because here's the thing that, again, if you look at this, the oil price always reacted to military conflict in the Middle East. And as a matter of fact, the uh, mystical number of 1973, uh, when the oil price uh, grew, uh, jumped uh, several times. Uh, this, uh, this year is related to a geopolitical event that you're all very well aware of. Actually, in other audiences, I have to remind people what happened in 1973. Here, I'm uh, absolutely sure I don't have to remind anyone. So uh, 1973, the War of Yom Kippur, and what happened then was, of course, that the Arab states didn't just use conventional force, as you know. They also used what was referred to as their secret oil weapon. When uh, the then president of Egypt and the king of Saudi Arabia agreed in advance that they would use the oil embargo against West Western countries for the first time. And because it was the first time and because it was secret, uh, the oil re market reacted very sharply. But basically since then, since then, the oil market became very nervous about what was happening in the Middle East. And as you can see, uh, most hikes in oil prices were related to something happening in the Middle East or the broader Middle East and North Africa. The second hike, or as, as it's known, the second oil crisis was a reaction to the revolution in Iran, but more so to the Iran-Iraq war. Um, then, if you, want, if you want the history of oil prices since 73 uh, in, in a couple of minutes, then 
1973 was the war of Yom Kippur and the Arab oil embargo, a revolution in Iran 1979, uh, 1980, uh, Iran-Iraq war begins, uh, Iraq's oil production drops, the market panics, the oil price goes up again, then uh, Saudi Arabia tries to, uh, then it starts falling because the market realizes that actually Iraqi oil production didn't fall as much as expected and then it recovered. So uh, the market panic uh, stopped, the price started going down very quickly and Saudi Arabia uh, started cutting production unilaterally and then tried to engage other OPEC countries, but it wasn't very successful. Though they, they carried on cutting production. Uh, they cut production from 10 million barrels a day to 3.6 million barrels a day. So they were at some point producing one third. Can you believe it? Nobody has ever cut production as much as they did. And what did they get? Well, not much, really. They, they think they stopped the oil price, but I would say the oil price didn't even react to this cut. It continued to fall. Then they stopped the cuts. It went up again. And then it basically carried on balancing uh, at a relatively stable level by historical standards um, up until 2003, effectively. Uh, 9-11 was uh, a big shock, uh, 2001, and then 2003 was a reaction. Well, what, there was Afghanistan, but then the invasion in Iraq, the war in Iraq, 2003. And that's the beginning of the, what I would call, I call it the uh, inflated oil price period, because it's not even a crisis. It was basically up until, from 2003 up until 2014, you, you have a big, period of inflated oil prices. Uh, and then 2014 happened. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, but what's interesting about the, uh, uh, the uh, emergence of ISIS uh, and the events in the Middle East is that uh, the reaction of the oil price, right? Because uh, not, not only is ISIS a brutal, uh, horrible organization, which shocked humanity with, with its uh, uh, brutality. But it also operates, if you think, in almost the very heart of oil, global oil production. Iraq itself is now a major oil producer. But not only that, uh, of course, cells of ISIS exist in other countries, including Yemen. So it almost surrounds Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, then, of course, it it went into Syria and uh, it uh, established cells or controlled territories in some other oil producing countries, including Libya and Nigeria through Boko Haram, which became at some point part of ISIS effectively. So if you think uh, from the oil market point of view, it's a shock event. And uh, uh, in judging from previous history, the market should have reacted very sharply with a uh, sharp oil price increase. Of course, you could say, well, it was already at 110. How f further up could it go? But, you know, back then, remember I showed you this slide of, uh, with quotes in 2013, 2014? People actually believed it would go further up. And I remember how people would say, uh, analysts would say, well, you know, we're at 110, it can go to 200 over the next 10 years. 200. I mean, now it sounds completely uh, insane, but people actually thought 200 was possible. And I, actually, they would whisper at conferences, and you know, 300, maybe someday, $300 per barrel. Um, so remember, that, that was the time of when people believed $200 per barrel was possible. Uh, so you would expect ISIS, huge shock to the market, uh, price would go up. And what happens? This happens. And as a matter of fact, as ISIS con continued to uh, proliferate, as other shock events 
happened, such as the Charlie Hebdo shooting in Paris. Of course, that's not in the Middle East, but this is all part of the bigger picture of Islamic terrorism. Uh, uh, other countries get involved. Does it remind you of anything? I mean, other countries get involved in the Middle Eastern conflict. Uh, Egypt, Turkey, then Russia. That is very much like what happened in 1973, actually. Because in 1973, and this is a horrible thing to think about right now, but actually the US and the USSR threatened each other with nu using nuclear weapons at that point. It was that bad. And it was stopped, luckily for all of us, but it was that bad. Uh, it was not that bad, but I mean, so many regional and even global powers got involved in this whole mess. Um, that again, you would expect the oil price to explode. What happens instead, it continues to fall. Right? So, um, what happened? And I think it is very important to understand what happened for the purposes of understanding uh, how oil economies work. Um, I'll tell you what I think happened. And again, remember, it's a black swan event. So it's not like one thing shifted the oil price. It is precisely that several unexpected factor collided, factors collided together at the same point in time and made that massive market shift um, that we're still seeing and uh, we're still experiencing. So um, one important event was this. So again, two things, right? Uh, ISIS, uh, horrible violence, the region is in flames, but the second thing, oil price continues to fall. Was there anything else that happened in 2014? The answer is yes. What happened was this. Three main oil producers in the world, uh, biggest, Saudi Arabia, Russia, or formerly the Soviet Union, and the United States. We often forget about the United States. And the, reasons we, the reason we forget about it is because up until 2007, it produced a much smaller amount of oil. And uh, it was a net oil importer. It is still a net oil importer but it is expected to become a net oil exporter in some not so distant future. So something has changed dramatically. Effectively, the United States almost doubled its oil production in a matter of less than 10 years. This is phenomenal. It has never happened so quickly at such a massive scale. So what we're seeing is basically a very rapid buildup of US oil production. Uh, and this is due primarily to shale production, production from shale uh, deposits. Um, and it's referred to as the, oil, as the shale oil revolution for a good reason. But it's not a revolution, you know how they say that a revolution is not going to be televised. So it, it was not really um, ev obvious that this was happening up until 2014. So yes, production was growing, but there was always a sense, well, it will grow for a while and then it will just flatten, but it didn't. So it, in 2014, what, happened, what else happened is that the United States, for the first time, reached the level and it even surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia as the top global oil producer. Uh, why is it important, uh, apart from the fact that it's important for the United States? It's also very important for global uh, economics. And if you th look at this picture, you see that you, the U.S. was the leader in global oil production up until a certain period of time. And if you look very closely, that is the same magic year, 1973. First, the Soviet Union surpassed the United States, and then Saudi Arabia did as well. This 
drop was d artificial because they cut oil production, as I told you. But uh, then both of them, uh, then Saudi Arabia became the leader. But effectively, 1973 was the last year when the United States was a global leader in oil production. And back in 2014. Why is this important? Because of two things. The nature of oil production in the United States is different. Uh, who produces oil in Saudi, Ar uh, Saudi Arabia? Okay. Yeah, Saudi Aramco, right? It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent owned by the government, or more specifically by the royal family. Um, well, that may change later this year uh, due to the IPO that they're doing, and that's a very interesting development, which we'll talk uh, more about today and tomorrow. But um, but in the United, uh, who produces oil in Russia? Well, more than 50% of it is produced by the government. And even in countries like Norway, for example, which is a, an example of a democracy in a Western country, actually more than 50% of oil is produced by the government. Not the case in the United States. In the United States, zero of oil is produced by the state. Moreover, uh, there are two types of oil companies. One is called the international, in the oil jargon, is called the international oil companies, IOCs. Big oil companies like ExxonMobil, Chevron, uh, ConocoPhillips, BP, and so on. Uh, and then there are the so-called independents, or the small and medium oil companies. Like in any industry, there are majors and smaller companies. So in the United States, more than 50% about 60% of oil and gas production cumulatively uh, is done by small and medium companies. It's quite a unique situation. And not only small and medium companies, the interesting thing is how many there are. The shale revolution that I was just talking about uh, was the result of the work of more than 13,000 independent oil and gas companies. So this is absolutely unique, plus the fact that in the, United, in the United States there's a specific system of land ownership which allows ownership of subsoil resources under the ground. So if you buy a plot of land, not only that the land belongs to you, but everything underneath, all the way to the core of the earth, where there's magma or ice, we don't know, probably magma, but all of it belongs to you, right? So... Um, Th that's quite unique. So it allows a much more a private ownership driven and entrepreneurial culture uh, where the owners of the land can, er, uh, what can capitalize very quickly on uh, oil which could be discovered on their land. Um, it's, it goes back to the 19th century, of course, in Pennsylvania and that system uh, of production. Uh, the second reason why this is important for the oil industry uh, and its future is because, so, you know, less state, more entrepreneurship. But the other reason is because, think about it from the geopolitical point of view. We saw this, pic, uh, this graph with uh, all the uh, military conflicts affecting the oil price. Where were those conflicts happening? Well, they were happening mostly in the Middle East and North Africa. So if leadership in production goes to the United States and the United States becomes what is known as the swing producer, uh, the producer which, that was the role of Saudi Arabia. Evident, evidently it's not anymore. Now uh, the United States actually is the swing producer which can decrease and increase production uh, uh, following market shifts. So when prices go up, it can rapidly, faster than Saudi Arabia, increase production. And when prices go down, decrease it. Um, so the United States is now the swing producer. And as a result, political stability has arrived. Because previously, when it was the role of Saudi Arabia, everything that happened around Saudi Arabia was very important for the market. Uh, all these conflicts, wars, and so on. Uh, and uh, the market, as I say, was very emotional about it. So everything, even a little conflict could affect it. Uh, not so much anymore, because as production shifts to uh, Western countries, 
mostly the United States, but also Canada, Australia. Um, that is not so important anymore. So that link between the oil price and political and military conflict has subsided. A quick overview, because that's our first, oh, no, there's one more thing. So uh, the Black Swan event uh, of the oil price drop is a result of, as I said, several uh, events that coincided, such as the shale revolution in the United States, uh, U.S. becoming the leader in oil production. Uh, a stronger dollar played a role as well. I'm just listing the cert certain things, right? Um, a slowdown in uh, Chinese growth played a role because there's also, let's not forget, there's also a demand factor apart from the supply factor. Um, the fact that there is more inf investment in exploration and production during high oil prices, uh, less influence uh, from OPEC and less discipline in OPEC and, um, for instance, uh, uh, a general trend of lower commodity prices played a, a certain role. So several factors. A quick summary. So uh, several significant price hikes since the 70s, uh, but the longest of them was 2003 uh, through 2014. Um, political events uh, played a role. Uh, the U.S. became uh, again the leader of oil production in 2014. The shale revolution, the U.S. becoming the swing producer, uh, the influence of Saudi Arabia falling. That creates a new situation in the oil market and a black swan, uh, a combination of different events, uh, which then lead to the collapse of the oil price. Um, now I'm going to talk about the structure uh, well, rather, the role of institutions and the role of government in the oil industry. And again, it starts, uh, well, not even in the 70s, it starts earlier. Um, the notion of resource nationalism is quite important because this is what really shaped the current system of uh, oil economics. Um, and interestingly, usually people think about Iran as the first country which nationalized uh, oil resources. Uh, it's true to some degree. In the post-war period, Iran was the first country. And some of you might remember the history of uh, uh, the British, uh, British Petroleum in Iran, uh, which was the British Iranian oil company. Uh, which was nationalized by Prime Minister Mossadegh. Uh, that was actually under the Shah, not, uh, not under Khomeini. Uh, and then uh, uh, there was a, an agreement between international companies uh, and the government of Iran. Then Khomeini, Khomeini came to power as a result of the Islamic Revolution, and everything was nationalized. Uh, but uh, Iran was not the first, actually. Uh, there were other countries which nationalized oil earlier, uh, such as, for instance, Mexico before World War II. The creation of Pemex as a state monopoly in Mexico uh, was an example. But, but interestingly, uh, we're celebrating, well, maybe celebrating is a bad word, but uh, this, is, this year marks the centenary, 100 years of uh, resource nationalism, when oil was nationalized. Um, guess which country it was? Yes. Um, it was Russia. Uh, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 uh, brought a new uh, communist government which had nation nationalization on its agenda and it started a very quick pro process of nationalizing all enterprises and of course one of them was oil. So uh, the first nationalization of an oil company was in Russia. Uh, and uh, I, I'll tell you why that is also symbolic towards the end. You'll find out what else happened. Uh, but um, if you look at this timeline, okay, basically Russia and Mexico are 
earlier than that, but after the war there was basically a series of nationalizations. And that coincided with what? Can you guess? What, what else happened after the World War II? Cold War. Mm? Cold War, yes, but this is something slightly different. The welfare system. No, <laughs> that was yesterday. I mean, we discussed that yesterday. That was, I think, your answer yesterday. It was correct <laughs> yesterday, not today. <laughs> There's not one answer to every question. <laughs> okay. Any other ideas? Look, look, uh, uh. Excellent, yes, exactly. Look at these countries. Um, basically, most of them are former colonies. And the collapse of the colonial system uh, with the big colonial empires such as Britain and France left those government, uh, governments uh, you know, facing a new reality. And the first things that they went after was oil. And there's an interesting reason why that happened. Uh, but uh, it was actually the first and the most important thing that they went after if they had oil. So you see, uh, that timeline, Iran, Brazil, I don't know what happened to the flag here, uh, Indonesia, oh, it's back. Uh, wow, I like that. Uh, Arg <laughs> uh, Argentina, uh, Egypt, Burma, Peru, uh, Algeria, Venezuela, Nigeria, Iraq, and Libya. Uh, and there were more than that. Those are just the biggest ones, right? Uh, so, you see, again, 1973 is, is again with us, but effectively, OPEC was formed, the uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, was formed in the 60s. And uh, it was, in a sense, all the result of this resource nationalism. Countries which first nationalized their resources, uh, and it's interesting because they had a different option. They could say, okay, we're independent now. Uh, British are out. Americans, to some degree, are out. The French are out. We have a choice. We can create national champions, uh, private national companies, or we can go for it and take it uh, as government property. And most of it chose the latter, to take it as government property. That wasn't now. A lot of people think, and OPEC would like you to believe, that was, was inevitable. Well, we were independent, so obviously we had to, to nationalize it. No, that wasn't obvious. And actually, not all countries did it, but most did. And um, the pro th that's, in my view, uh, one of the reasons for what happened next in the 70s. This is all connected because you have um, nationalization, uh, and then you have the creation of OPEC as an attempt to control the market by governments, let's not forget, to influence for the market. And uh, OPEC was very, very influential in the 60s and 70s because it accounted for 90% of global production. Today it accounts for less than 50, but back then it was 90% of oil production globally. So a very significant amount. Um, uh, and then you have those wars and conflicts, and it all coincides. Uh, so the market changes, and it reacts to it with a price hike. The uncertainty created by wars, but not just wars, the uncertainty created by the fact that now governments control oil, and they're not, as I think we would agree, they're not the most efficient managers. So if they're in charge, the market gets worried about continuity and stability of supply. And the reaction is the high oil prices. Um, you can see that some countries are quite a, a, a phenomenal example of failure. Uh, countries like, for instance, Venezuela, Iran, or Libya, uh, this graph shows them compared to the world uh, average economic growth. And Libya is quite amazing because it was 
very, very successful in the beginning. Uh, but then when Gaddafi came to power, uh, and again, oil was nationalized, of course, but it's not just the nationalization, it was, it was the sheer incompetence, uh, because essentially he was a complete lunatic, uh, uh, as, as you well know. Uh, the incompetence uh, of his government uh, and the corruption of it uh, made Libya, Libya go from being a very successful economy to, to pr practically economic, well, not, if not collapse, but a, a very, very miserable existence. Venezuela is another uh, uh, very sad example, and I'm sure you've been hearing about it uh, in the news, but uh, uh, the interesting thing, as we were told yesterday uh, by Robert Barrow, is that uh, Venezuela was one of the richest countries in the world after World War II, because you know, as, uh, as a prosperous uh, economy with strong institutions, interestingly, uh, it, it was not affected by World War II, so it benefited on a global scale, and uh, it was one in the top 10 of richest countries in the world. Today, and this is a very rare example in general, but for an oil economy, it's a mind-boggling example. Today, Venezuela's GDP per capita is lower in purchasing power parity terms than it was 50 years ago. It's a, a terrible, terrible performance. Uh, and not only that, the interesting thing is that Venezuela's oil production today is lower than it was 50 years ago. And that is given that Venezuela, and this is interesting, when I ask people, what, which country do you think has the highest uh, oil reserves in the world? The answer is usually either Saudi Arabia or Russia. It's not. It's Venezuela. Venezuela has the biggest oil reserves in the world. A country with the biggest oil reserves in the world has dropped oil production and has a lower GDP per capita than it had half a century ago. And today it has uh, ri food riots. People are rioting and people are queuing for hours and even days for mo the most basic products. It's at the brink of a complete economic collapse. And that's all with the, you know, uh, with all the oil wealth that they have. It's impossible to even imagine how bad that management um, is. So this uh, made people think, and there was an interesting book I recommend, which is, um, uh, was written by uh, an American uh, political science, uh, scientist, uh, Terry Lynn Carl. Um, um, about, uh, about, the, um, about oil economies, uh, um, and uh, I'll give you a link later, about uh, uh, oil economies and uh, uh, the uh, oil curse. Uh, and uh, she studied uh, uh, the h histories of oil economies like Venezuela. She actually started with Venezuela. And she, uh, uh, she came to the conclusion that there is this oil curse, that countries dependent on oil and gas are doomed to perform like this. Um, the, the oil curse uh, theory uh, was very influential and it is still to a degree influential in, uh, uh, many, among many economists. Uh, but um, some other economists challenged it and uh, I followed that discussion. And about 10 years ago, I started getting very curious about it and I decided to do my own research. And uh, uh, as uh, Bob mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, I published a paper uh, with the Cato Institute just this year, which kind of encapsulates all my research over the last 10 years into the subject. And it, it, the title of this uh, uh, paper is Curse or Blessing, uh, How Institutions Determine Success in uh, Resource-Rich Economies. Uh, and I'm trying to answer the question whether this is an inevitable result. And the answer is no, it is not. 
there are unfortunately many examples of countries which uh, 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 which uh, economy is deteriorated, but it's not inevitable. So this is the report. Uh, you can download it. It's free, uh, available online. Uh, I'll give you uh, very briefly the main uh, idea of the report, uh, and uh, it's the following. What we did, we analyzed uh, with my colleagues, because I have a, a think tank, uh, so it's a collective effort. Uh, we analyzed uh, the performance of oil and gas economies, and more generally resource economies, so some mining economies as well, because their economic structure is quite similar. For instance, Chile, which is the biggest copper exporter in the world, or Botswana, which is the biggest uh, biggest diamonds exporter in the world. We analyzed their economies and tried to look for certain patterns. And one thing which is interesting is if you divide them by the, their institutional development, by their institutional strength, and look at their performance in terms of GDP per capita, uh, if you don't like GDP, some people like it, some people don't like it as an indicator, you have other, human development index, for instance, or some specific uh, measurements, such as the level of corruption, for example. Or some people uh, are concerned that oil economies are very anti-democratic, and some of them are. So, for instance, the uh, index of political and uh, uh, individual freedoms. So you can look at very um, different measurements, but you basically compare them by institutional strength. Uh, and in order to do that, we took their ratings in several um, publications, the leading publications, to be balanced so that we don't rely on just one measurement of institutional strength. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. Some of them were mentioned yesterday uh, by Robert. Uh, Doing Business, for instance, uh, published by the World Bank. Uh, the Global Competitiveness Report, published by uh, Davos. And then the one I would specifically recommend is the Fraser Institute uh, Economic Freedom of the World Index. Uh, it's the oldest of those, by the way, the most established one. And it also has uh, certain topical surveys and sub-indices dedicated specifically to natural resources. One is the surveying of mining companies. Uh, survey of mining companies is very well regarded in the mining industry, and they have a similar one for uh, oil companies as well. So uh, that's, that's quite a good source of information. So we took them and divided all uh, resource countries into four quartiles, the ones with strongest institutions by all of these ratings, uh, second quartile, third, and finally the worst, the fourth quartile. And you can see so those are the three indices, uh, economic freedom of the world, Fraser Institute doing business World Bank, and global competitiveness. Uh, you can see that there's a pattern. Basically, GDP per capita, uh, interestingly, GDP per capita on average in resource economies basically is the same as the world average. So the average doesn't show any resource curse, actually. Uh, but then, when you divided them, uh, divide them into groups, you can see that countries with strong institutions perform much better than the world average, which is basically a, a refutation of the resource curse. It's not a curse, because there's some countries which are clearly not cursed. They grow faster than the world average. And then there are, there are countries which grow roughly at the rate of the world average, and which do worse. Uh, we looked at other indicators, as I said, the Human Development Index of the uh, UN. You have a similar picture, the same pattern. Strong institutions, more economic freedom, and if you look at uh, the criteria for economic freedom, of the Economic Freedom Index, um, they have property rights, uh, the the uh, strength of the judiciary, uh, 
and then uh, uh, tax burden and several other parameters, but key indicators of institutional strength and economic freedom. Countries with stronger institutions and freer economies do better in terms of human development index. Um, if you look at corruption, same picture. Transparency International, I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, some countries do awfully badly uh, on this index. But again, so countries with strongest institutions, the freest economies, uh, do better than the world average. No curse. And as I mentioned, violations of civil liberties, it's again a similar picture. You have uh, less violations in countries with stronger institutions and more economic freedom. So as a brief uh, recap, uh, we have uh, the peak of resource nationalism in the 60s and 70s, uh, which then brought us to the development of uh, emergence of, o of OPEC. Uh, institutional development in many OPEC countries then began to fall. Uh, there are countries with the most evident institutional failures, such as Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria, Libya, Algeria, and at the same time, in the upper quartile, you have countries like Canada, or Australia, or Norway, or to some degree Malaysia, which is not a OECD country yet, but it's one of the countries in Asia which is closest to become an OECD member. Um, so with institutional strength and more economic freedom, uh, you have higher results in GDP, Human Development Index, uh, less corruption, uh, and uh, that means that there is no curse uh, of resources. With the right institutions, the right institutions determine effectively whether oil is a curse or a blessing. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll say a few words about the future of uh, the petrostate, so to speak. Uh, and I think this is also interesting for Israel uh, and important for Israel uh, for several reasons. One is because Israel is surrounded by countries uh, in, uh, which, which are petrostates. Uh, and it, the regional situation, security situation, uh, an economic situation is influenced by those countries. And secondly, because Israel might become, well, technically not a petro state, but maybe a gas state uh, itself, which will have a significant share of income from gas production and gas exports. Um, one interesting thing that happened uh, after the oil price collapse is that in several countries which are qualified as petro states, uh, something started changing. Uh, people started to, citizens started to, uh, uh, to question the very foundations of the petrostate and the system of rent redistribution. They were unhappy about corruption, especially corruption. And anti-corruption movement uh, brought change in several countries. One of the most remarkable cases is that of Brazil. I'm sure you heard about it. Uh, the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, the president, was actually the result of an anti-corruption campaign based on the Petrobras case, the national oil company. The, the corruption, was, corruption permeated the whole system, but the first investigation and the case brought against Dilma Rousseff was for corruption in the oil company. Um, and the, the interesting thing was that not just uh, that the protests were so massive. Uh, at one day, more than 7 million people went to the streets in the whole, across the whole country, 7 million people. Um, but also the fact that unlike previous political movements, especially in Latin America, you know, of course, Che Guevara and the whole uh, sort of uh, heroization of uh, left uh, uh, radicals. This movement was not a left-wing populist movement. 
As a matter of fact, it was a pro-market, generally speaking, a pro-freedom, pro-individual freedom movement. And one of the slogans uh, developed by uh, the young uh, Brazilian libertarians caught up with the entire movement and became one of the main slogans of the movement as in general. It was menos Marx, mais Mises, which means less Marx, more Mises. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's quite uh, surprising uh, and encouraging, I think. Uh, but then uh, similar things ha started happening in other countries. Uh, Nigeria, I was there actually myself as a consultant for the government uh, in 2014 and 15, and they held elections in 2015. Everyone was expecting uh, the former pre then president, good luck, Jonathan. I know it's a funny name, good luck. Uh, but uh, he didn't, have, didn't seem to have much luck with, in these elections. Everyone was expecting him to actually rig the elections and win by any means possible. Uh, but he was actually quite uh, reasonable and he recognized uh, the uh, victory of his opponent, Muhammad Buhari. Um, Muhammad Buhari came to power on an anti-corruption platform, again, interestingly, and the corruption was in the National Oil Company, most of it. And then uh, the case of, here's a little overview for you, uh, so Nigeria. Uh, then there was the case of 1MDB, the Malaysian scandal. I gave some praises to Malaysia, but unfortunately corruption uh, is, the, is present there as well. So uh, Najib Razak, the uh, prime minister, um, got uh, 700 million uh, US dollars paid directly by a private company into his bank account. Uh, not a very uh, sophisticated system of corruption, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, that came out and uh, caused a political crisis. He's still in power, but the opposition has become stronger. Uh, so there are some changes. And then there was this sort of uh, new globalized uh, movement against corruption, um, a, a network of anonymous hackers, journalists, which worked together and uh, unveiled uh, the case of Mossack Fonseca in Panama. Uh, again, many of you might have heard, uh, known as the Panama Papers, which revealed corruption through these uh, accounts in Panama, uh, corruption in dozens of countries around the world, even in Western countries as well. Uh, and among these countries were uh, more than a dozen of oil economies, including Saudi Arabia, Russia, Algeria, uh, Iraq, uh, and so on and so forth. So another explosion of corruption cases uh, in oil economies. Uh, Russia, and we can talk about it uh, tomorrow because we don't have much time today, but uh, Russia was a, another case. Uh, it seems to be uh, what I would call, mm, uh, I would call, uh, a, uh, there are the modernizers of oil, uh, which we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, and then there are the, what I call the custodians, uh, uh, the conservatives, the custodians of the old petrostate model. Uh, and Russia seems to be one of them, so it's defending the old system uh, ferociously. Whether it's working or not is still not clear. I mean, so far, you know, Putin has appeared on the covers of many Western magazines, including Time as the uh, most influential world leader. And actually, I think he is, unfortunately, uh, the most influential world leader. Uh, but uh, certain things are happening in Russia. Uh, Russia saw its prote protests in 2011-2012, uh, uh, not as big as in Brazil, but quite big. Um, then there was sort of a lull uh, from 2012 to 2017 uh, when Putin regained power uh, and influence and popularity. But um, just last month, uh, on uh, the 26th of March uh, this year, um, there were protests again in Russia, unexpectedly big. Uh, 
uh, and spread throughout the country. And they were all due to a film release, uh, which you can watch online, uh, which in, in Russian uh, is called On Vam Nidimon, uh, which is very difficult to translate. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, it's mocking uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the uh, prime minister and uh, uh, Putin's closest ally. Uh, but it's about uh, massive allegations of corruption. Uh, they're not proved in the court, but try proving it in a Russian court. Uh, they're, they're not, but uh, they raised a wave of discontent and questions in the society uh, about what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, in, uh, in the, um, among the elite. So we'll see, uh, but certain things are happening. Uh, and uh, uh, I think there, there are two responses. One is the response effectively of uh, Russia, which is, as I said, a, a sort of a protective response. Things are changing in the world. The oil price has fallen. Well, we'll deny it for a while. When it's impossible to deny, we'll recognize. But then we'll sort of create a protective fence around our political and economic system not to allow any change. And that may work for a while, but it's not clear for how long. Uh, and then there's a reaction of modernization. And again, when we think about modernization, we think, OK, maybe Malaysia, uh, maybe Mexico, uh, but not the most conservative cases like Saudi Arabia, but actually modernization is a relative thing. So it can happen even in the most conservative societies. And as a matter of fact, it will make bigger changes in the most conservative societies because there's a very conservative basis to start from. And uh, I think it's quite remarkable that Saudi Arabia, which is one of the most conservative countries in the world, uh, with very low ratings of uh, civil liberties, one of the lowest in the world, um, and where uh, the, the oil company Saudi Aramco be belongs to the uh, uh, royal family and the government, uh, actually announced uh, a privatization. Well, a partial one, but still. Uh, uh, an IPO will mean that it will have to release a lot of information about its performance for the first time in decades. Very interesting. And what, what will happen then? Uh, it's expected to be the biggest IPO in the world history, for sure. Uh, the, you know, the valuation of Saudi Aramco is too early to tell, but it's somewhere between uh, one and two trillion dollars. Um, so the, uh, this, this is going to be very, very uh, uh, important for, for Saudi Arabia, for the region, and I think for the broader global uh, economy and especially for oil economies, because if it starts a trend, uh, that might bring more openness in other countries as well. This is certainly not a bottom-up case, it's a top-bottom case, but still. So we'll talk about modernization, uh, how oil can be an engine of growth, uh, and uh, so on tomorrow. I don't know if we have any time for questions, but I'll make sure tomorrow. Uh, do we have any time at all? OK. But I'll, I'll make sure, because this was sort of the foundation of it. Tomorrow will be more cases and discussion. So we can do that tomorrow. So uh, let's take maybe two questions and the rest we'll do tomorrow, okay? <laughs> um, you were referring to corruption and a lot of other things to indicate whether the, so that, to indicate that it is a blessing, but you didn't refer to the amount of oil that we, for, for example, in Israel, if we're referring to gas, um, I'll say what, I, what I'm going at because we don't have much time, um, the Dutch disease, is that something that you think does indicate at all, like the amount of gas that you have and then following that, mm -hmm. how you handle it as okay. for whether it's a curse or a blessing? Mm -hmm. uh, the short, okay, I didn't say it is a necessarily a blessing. Yeah, I leave it as an open question. I think it's neither a curse nor a blessing. It depends on your institutions and your policies uh, and the structure of your oil and gas industries. For Israel, it can be, well, 
blessing or not, it can be an engine, a motor of economic growth. It can be. And I think the general premise, the institutional framework for that is here. Because Israel is a democracy. It made a principal decision not to nationalize oil and gas. And that I think was very wise because we saw what happens when you do. Um, and uh, uh, it is a very entrepreneurial culture. So all the basics are here. Now there are some crossroads about policy decisions that need to be made. And we heard about it on Monday. We can talk about it tomorrow. Um, now very important decisions are being made. So it can go one way or another. I don't think it will be a curse. Uh, Dutch disease is covered in my report. We can talk about it tomorrow. I don't think it's a very important subject. I don't think actually it's, it's the major problem for oil com uh, and uh, gas economies. Uh, I specifically wouldn't worry about it too much now because the Dutch disease is, if it, uh, uh, is something that happened during very high oil and gas prices, which is not the case right now. So there's not much of a risk of a Dutch disease for Israel right now. Okay. Another question? Okay, I think you were first. Uh, what is your expectation for the oil prices? And do you think another fund that comes in the month will be full of prices? Well, for the first one, I have a, a rule that I do not give oil price forecasts uh, because it's uh, a, a, a very bad idea. Um, um, so I will not answer this question, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the second one, um, well, yeah, that can happen. I mean, uh, from the top of my head, countries which are on th at the brink of collapse are proud from Venezuela. Right now, among oil con economies, well, I mean, uh, Libya is, is, in a, in the, is in a horrible state. Uh, Iraq is, is not in a good shape. Uh, uh, Algeria is not in a very good shape. Uh, uh, Nigeria itself, I mean, a bit better than before. Um, Venezuela is by far the worst case, I think. Uh, but there are other problem cases. Uh, I mean, on principle, uh, I would say that uh, some of these countries have bigger problems because they have a blockage in, the, in civil society and the political system. Uh, like, for instance, Ven Venezuela, where the government is very autocratic, and an economic mismanagement problem. Those which have both are doing worse. For instance, Venezuela has a lot of economic problems, but it is, by and large, a democracy. Uh, Mexico is, a, by and large, a, um, a democracy. So they, have, they don't have much economic competence, especially in manage managing oil, because Pemex in Mexico is an awful company. But... Uh, they, they have a system of renewing the government, so they're doing better. You know, if you have either democracy or markets, uh, at least one is always better. If you have neither, that's, that's very bad. Okay, I think we can talk about the rest tomorrow. Uh, so please, if you have, I can see you have questions, keep them until tomorrow. Thank you very much.